thank you all uh, to accepting our invitation and coming to Prague, not only to discuss these unsettling issues I advertised, but also to celebrate 30 years of our magazine. It's been 30 years since the year Professor Timothy Garten Esch called the best year in European history. Um, 30 years since the fall of the Iron Curtain. What have we learned in those three decades about the transition from undemocratic regime towards liberal democracy? And what have we learned apart from the fact that it's obvious to all of us here that it's a long and sometimes difficult or maybe all the time difficult process? Timothy, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, before I answer that very easy question, <laughs> let me first of all express my huge respect for respect. <laughs> I, I, I have to tell you, when my very good friend Yakim Topol told me 30 years ago that they were going to do this new magazine and they were going to call it Respect, I said to him, that's a really bad title for a magazine. Because Why? Journali well, because journalists should not be respectful. They should be critical. They should be independent. They should be combative. But the success of the magazine, and it's doing a fantastic job, I really mean that, a fantastic job, and independent media are so important, shows an old truth, which is, if the magazine or newspaper is good enough, it really doesn't matter what it's called. So, so congratulations, happy birthday, respect. The second thing is, because we're going to spend the next two hours talking about the problems, and it really struck me, you know, I, I did the 10th anniversary, I did the 20th anniversary, the 25th, the 30th is all about what went wrong, what the problems have been, what, what did we do wrong. So it's really important to say that while the Velvet Revolution here was not the earliest, not the most important, perhaps not the most impactful of the events of 1989. It was by far the most beautiful, the most magical, the most wonderful. And you wrote one of the most beautiful short chapters in European history. And please don't let anyone take that away from you. And it's really interesting that the term Velvet Revolution, which initially had a capital V and R, i.e. just what happened in Prague and Bratislava, the, 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 the Czechoslovakia, is now used for all. It's become a species of revolution, going all the way from Prague to Hong Kong. Now, to your question, what went wrong? Look, this, we could go on further. Well, my on this. question wasn't really what went wrong. What have we learned? Maybe we well, learned something positive and not really okay. negative. Okay, let me tell you a couple of things. First of all, one thing we knew at the time, which was this was going to be bloody difficult because communism had destroyed so much. So you remember the joke at the time, well, we, you, we know you can turn an aquarium into fish soup, but can you turn fish soup back into an aquarium? So we knew how difficult it was going to be, and many of the problems you see here are a result of the challenges of transformation, particularly privatization. So your current Prime Minister, Andrei Babish, is a classic example of the dangers of a too fast and too corrupt privatization, which happened all over post-communist Europe, because what you end up with is a prime minister who's a classic post-communist oligarch and a former secret police informer. And that's not a great place to be. So that's one point. But I think even if you'd had the most brilliantly con conducted uh, transition, I think it would still have been difficult. Two other quick points. Uh, there are many we can talk about. In two respects, Actually, in three respects, we liberals, in the broadest sense, having got rid of communism, started making the mistakes of the communists. Number one, after realizing how extraordinary this event was, within 10 years, we were kind of assuming this was the new normal, the way things were going to be, the way history was going, the direction history was traveling. That's a communist mistake, to assume there are laws of history. That's mistake number one. Mistake number two, 
is that increasingly liberalism became a kind of closed system, like an ideology which claimed to have all the answers. And that is not liberalism. Liberalism is a method of experimentation, of trial and error, of, of the contest of ideas. So I think that was the second mistake. The third mistake, following the communists, was that we reduced liberalism to the purely economic dimension, to one dimension. So you'll remember that Karl Marx argued that being determines consciousness. Remember that, any of you who were at school before 1989, being determines consciousness. Um, having got rid of communism, we then made the mistake of thinking once again that being would determine consciousness, that it was the economy stupid, right? And then what we see in the populist movements today is that it's not the economy stupid, it's consciousness stupid. So those were at least three little mistakes I think we made. Would you like to, would you like to react to it? Well, there's, there's an interesting, oh, first of all, I want to say that I'm very glad to be here with reporters because in case I forget to say it later, r reporters are the heroes of our time and we can't do without them. And I'm, I'm counting Tim Garton Nash on this because when I met him, he was still chiefly a reporter and it was only in supervising my doctoral dissertation, I think, that he took on another guise. So I'm very glad to be here with all of these reporters and I'm very glad to be here with you the oddness for me of being on this stage is that I believe that all the things that I tell people in Europe or in the West, I took from Eastern Europe and I took from the part of my life which was 20 or 30 years ago. So my, my debt is to you and I'm very glad that I have the chance to, to speak to you and, and with you. Five years ago, or maybe it was 10 or 15, um, Martin said at one of these anniversaries that uh, he had believed after 1989 that East Europeans had something to tell West Europeans, but that this had turned out to be a sad mistake. I want to start commenting on what Tim said by disagreeing with that, because I think a key underlying element of what Tim Garton Nash has just said has to do with the idea of responsibility. One way of thinking about the problem of this one-dimensional liberalism or this determinist liberalism is that it takes away responsibility. If you really believe that capitalism is going to bring about democracy or preserve democracy, then you don't have to do anything for democracy. If you really believe that history works itself out in a certain direction, good, bad, indifferent, then you don't have to care about responsibility, which is why in retrospect it seems so important to me that the very political idea of responsibility, which was so essential in discussions here and elsewhere in Eastern Europe in the 1970s and 1980s, was an important lesson from you, which we discarded to our peril in, in the early 1990s. And whose responsibility do you mean? Like every single citizen or the political elites or all the mentioned? I think, so democracy means rule by the people. It doesn't mean rule by lonely atomized individuals who are not doing anything. So in order for there to be democracy, there has to be a people. And for there to be a people, every single citizen has to lean out a little bit against his or her own private inclinations and into some kind of larger idea of responsibility. So yes, I do mean everyone, but I also mean, I think, some of the same people that Tim Gard Nash had in mind, namely um, those of us in the West and in Eastern Europe who deferred responsibility to larger forces, who said, the economy will come in, history will come in. Um, we, since we know the answers, we don't have to think too hard right now about what's going to happen. But 
Then again, on responsibility, um, what exactly do you think that each of us should do in our uh, daily lives? This is quite a task, right? And, and everyone is busy, so is there something we should do in order to be responsible? Well, we've moved very quickly to practical advice. Um, yes. So you mean to your book? <laughs> uh, well, that, I mean, I, so I, I think, again, you're, you're asking me, uh, you're asking an American in 2019 about the best remembered essay that Václav Havel wrote in 1977. I mean, the most, the most remarkable and the most, I think, durable political advice that Václav Havel gives has to do precisely with everyday behavior. That the little things that you do, the words that you say or you don't say, how you choose to speak, because that whole essay is really about a few small actions or a few small words, that these things have a double importance. They make you the kind of person who might be able to do bigger things later, but they also set a kind of example. So um, in, 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 there is a way that, that everything we do is political. Um, the notion of civil society depends upon everyone thinking that he or she is a bit of an example, not a dramatic example, but a bit of an example. And little things like, um, I'm only gonna do this populist thing once, but little things like actually subscribing to newspapers <laughs> um, make a tremendous historical difference. I'm gonna assume that everyone who laughed at that joke does not in fact subscribe. So now you have a concrete example of something you can do before you go to sleep tonight. Yeah, me and Katarzyna would like to stress out we completely agree with this answer. Thank you for that. Milan, um, you're an outsider and insider at the same time. Um, do you know what I mean by that? <laughs> okay. um, I'll try to figure out. I mean, yeah, but what, my question is, do you agree with the point of view of a Brit, an American? And do you think the lessons we learned as Czechs and Slovaks somehow differ from this point of view from the outside? Um, well, one sentence, I thank you for inviting me and thank you to be here because I'm, in, I, I'm because if I'm insider, it means that I'm re once respect for ever respect, like Indri Shilo said, so that's me too. Um, um, well, I think that it's, uh, there are some differences and, and, and Timothy was right when I, I remember that when I, 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 when I said, and I said in 89 actually, because I remember that European was expecting from Eastern Europe that, that it could bring something, some new spirit to West, to the Western, whatever, consumerism, Western democracy. And I was deeply convinced we had nothing to bring. Um, and uh, when I said that, uh, I disappointed my friends in the West very much, especially from the left. Um, and I still think, well, uh, I think now we have something, when I listen to Tim, both Timothy's, yeah, we are actually in the common situation today, thanks to mm, Brexit and thanks to Trump. Uh, welcome. Look at that. Oh yeah, well, welcome in the, not, not our world. Um, so, uh, uh, yes. And when I think about, I mean, coming back to your question, what we have learned and what we can actually talk to, together with the West and the East, is I remember that in, uh, 89 was all about freedom. Now there are debates here, whether the people actually didn't want the freedom, they want to consume, and they actually want to be the Westerners without, the, they, didn't, they didn't talk about freedom, it's not, that's not truth. We remember that, people wanted freedom. The problem is what I think, what I have learned, and we should probably all, or we have learned, all of us, is that freedom is not just a word, I mean, freedom without um, dignity, without uh, possibly to enjoy that freedom, is no freedom. We thought in 89, if we give people freedom, so they will just use it. But how can people use their freedom if they are pre-imprisoned in their villages because they are poor? How can, you know, there are a lot of people who are not free in these countries. 
And I, I mean, Romas are not free. Um, people aren't equal. Many of them are left behind. That's the same problem as, as in the US and wherever they are in the Eastern Europe. And I think that we are learning that, well, freedom has, again, the same but a new meaning. It's not only about the, what we had thought in 89, just give people freedom it's, and we'll be fine. We have to take care that the people can this in freedom enjoy and use. And that's what we didn't quite well understood, understand in 89. I slowly understand that slowly, and I think it's our task for the future if we talk about common lesson, and it's actually the same for the West. What do you think it was the most important thing we didn't understand in 1989 about freedom? Well, I think that that's, we didn't understand that um, freedom, dignity, and equality are the same notions. I mean, it doesn't work without one without another. And we, because we thought, because most of us were from dissent, so we thought, well, just give, you, give us the freedom and we are fine. We don't need anybody else. But we were exceptional because of our experience. And we didn't think about the people who, for them, that freedom was not the same word as for us. And I remember very well, I was, uh, yeah, when Timothy mentioned Václav Havel, I also was, I mean, Václav was for me a, a symbolical figure, but also the father of all, many ideas. And he was talking about the, uh, the, the freedom cannot be separated from it. I mean, if some other people are not free, so we are not free as well. It was mentioned in that time maybe because of the political prisoners, but this is still, it still works. It's still, it's still the same. If there are people in this society who are not free, we are not free. We cannot talk about ourselves as a free people. And that's a lesson of these 30 years for myself, definitely. I wanted to give the floor to Natalie, but uh, no, no, Timothy... Natalie first, to Natalie. Can I? No, no. no. So? To Natalie first, definitely. Okay, Dobry večer. <laughs> it's... I, 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 can't say, I can't say what an emotion it is for me to be here tonight. Um, I'm French. I've been based in London for five years. I grew up partly in Canada, which is why I speak English with this accent. Um, and, and not like this. <laughs> and <laughs> but it's very nice like this. But, uh, you can try. Nice like this. <laughs> um, and when I was um, 23, year old, 23 years old, the Berlin Wall fell and I watched it uh, on television in Paris. I was a student. And uh, shortly afterwards, I went on a, I got on the train to Berlin. I wanted to see it. And I spent some time in Berlin. Um, and it was a huge impression. And then I took the train from Berlin to Prague. Uh, but this was after, after November 17. I spent some time in Berlin. And I arrived in, in Prague and I, I took the night train. And I'm saying this because I took the same train this morning. I took from Berlin, I took the same train this morning. The quality hasn't improved. <laughs> it's actually perfect. And I, you know, you can, I could get my, my, uh, my emails all along. Um, and I, what I want to say is um, the, the motion is because I have kept some friends here. And I, I, I decided in uh, 91 that I would live here for two years. Uh, I was a young journalist. This is where I learned uh, how to do journalism. This is, it was in Czechoslovakia, in Prague, and I have, uh, w one of the things that I'm grateful for is that I have kept some good friends here despite some of my, you know, not always excellent journalism because I was a beginner. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have this experience. And what, uh, perhaps to your question, what I'd like to, to share is, um, perhaps the, the three very short lessons that I, I take away from these three decades. It, I think in the end it's hard for me to speak for everybody or you know, many of us, but my personal lessons are, um, one, we, we Europeans, have to, especially the younger generation, have to pay more attention to history and read history and learn about history, not to scare ourselves, but to encourage ourselves that 
good things can happen and to understand what the good dynamics are and what the bad dynamics are. When I came to, when I came to Prague in 89, I was so ignorant. I had studied political science. Uh, I had done a postgraduate. I was in the middle of my postgraduates in journalism, but I was so ignorant. I, I knew so little actually about this part of Europe. So what I'm, what I, the positive thing I, I take is that I have personally learned much more about the history of Europe, and I today see the history and the experience of Europe as something where we are actually all together with all our conflicting and contrasted memories and experiences. But me as a French person, as a Western European uh, uh, who's traveled across Central Europe and who spent quite a few years in the former Soviet Union, I worked in Russia for many years, I, I look at our part of the world and I, and I see much more sharply that we share something which is a multitude of experiences and a part of the world that we have to tre treasure and that is rich of its diversity, rich of its memories, rich of its family stories. I have a family story that connects to Europe's story. I'm sure everybody in this room has a family story that connects to Europe's story. And as a reporter, for me, the most fascinating thing was to discover these family stories, to go to these places, to learn about the experience of a part of Europe that I was not familiar with. Very shortly, the two other lessons are, if I had to do my studies again, I would, I would study not just history, but I would study law. Because I think that today in Europe, what protects us, the, the, and this was mentioned in the previous debate, what protects us the most from the dark tendencies, let's say, it's law, rule of law, and the people who protect the rule of law. Good judges, uh, good courts, uh, people who study law, people who defend uh, the, the precise wording of legal texts, who base their work on the conventions, the European conventions on human rights, I'm interested in how law protects us. In the whole debate about populism, I kind of, I have come to the conclusion that actually I'm not really interested in the word populism, I must say. I'm interested in the word democratic or anti-democratic. You know, is, does this political party respect democratic principles, rule of democratic rule of law, or doesn't it? Um, and, this, and the last thing is, what was it? Um, yes, the, the, the other, the last thought is, there were many heroes. 89 for me is a moment of heroes. The, 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 the famous heroes and the unsung heroes, the anonymous heroes. And, and we have to cherish that, we have to celebrate that. And there are still heroes today. And I, I, you know, I could list, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are people who continue to demonstrate for you know, fundamental values, people who fight as, as, as journalists, people who fight as lawyers. There are heroes not just in Europe, there are heroes outside Europe. And we have to sometimes you know, uh, celebrate the heroes. And uh, as journalists, I think we should celebrate them more. Natalie, thank you very much for the positive tone. I feel uh, compromised and in the awkward position because I wanted to ask a really critical question related to your Frenchness. But uh, okay, but I'll try. I'll, I'll do my best. I'll try. Um, here, Timothy Gotten Esch said once uh, a very interesting night's line, which is fight for freedom is never finished. And um, just a few weeks ago, one specific event uh, uh, drew my attention to that line, which was when the French president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, helped block accession negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania. And then I was thinking more uh, and recalling my um, interviews with various Western European diplomats and politicians and regular people who would tell you basically that um, the enlargement of the EU, enlargement of Western Europe to the East, um, showed us or taught us that lesson that the transit to democracy is never uh, irreversible, that it's actually a reversible process. And it can be that enlargement uh, of the EU can be a source of weakness rather than strength. Um, so my question to you is, 
and the French and Western Europeans uh, in more broader terms. Are they too impatient? Isn't it unfair to be so critical of not only North Macedonians, but also us? Because as Timothy Gardner said, fight for freedom is never finished. You're asking me to comment on exactly what Macron's position was on all these questions, or, or just the French, Do uh, as you please. French uh, outlook. Listen, I think you know. Um, I think um, France is a country that is uh, right now uh, trying to define its uh, role, like, like other countries are trying to define their roles, um, and. Certainly, Britain is, is is looking for leaving us. For we'll we'll let we'll let Brexit. What, what I mean what I mean is that the the eighty nine and the transformations of Europe have of course painted a new uh, a new landscape, and uh, I love I love one sentence by a former Belgian uh, uh, politician. His name is uh, he he's dead now, but his name was Paul Henri Spack. He's considered as one of the fathers of the European project, but he's less well known than uh, Monet or Schumann or um, the Gasperi Adenauer. Um, and he said uh, once that there are two categories of countries in Europe. There are category, there is uh, the category of countries who are, who are small, and there's the category of countries who don't yet know that they are small. And uh, what, that, what, that means, what that means is that we have, we have this part of you know, a continent with a multitude of countries. And in this, in this 21st century, in the situation that we are in today, we have to try to find ways to really be obsessed with our unity, be obsessed with our unity. Because there are big actors outside our, our our geographical space that are just waiting to, you know, and are already quite active. We have to be obsessed with our unity. So if I had a little comment to say about some of Macron's recent uh, statements, the way they are expressed, um, this, the, this, the tone, I think he should be very careful. I'm not, I'm not, look, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not commenting on the substance of what he has decided or, but he should be very careful in his tone not to fuel more European divisions. And um, the, the France has its problems, Germany has its problems, the UK has its problems, everybody has problems. If we start pointing fingers uh, in a sort of easy way, uh, we, are, we are making the divisions worse. And I think there are many people in Europe who actually care about our, our unity, our cap capability to find a common understanding. And it's, it's, not good to, it's not good enough to grandstand and to give the, imp give the impression that you are looking down on some smaller countries. David Garnesh, you speak extensively about the whole West, East. You speak extensively about the newly restored divide, if I may call it like this, between West and East. But you probably wanted to react to what Milan said previously. So, first of all, could we just agree that Tim Snyder doesn't have to defend Trump? Natalie doesn't have to defend every statement made by Emmanuel Macron, and I don't have to defend Brexit. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Just set that out there, because... We don't I, expect you to you, defend you, you, that. When he said, yeah, well... In fact, you've got the most untypical Britain-American in the world <laughs> on this panel. <laughs> We're both sort of honorary Central Europeans. Um, three quick reactions on three things. Number one, just to take up where Natalie left off. Um, it was a formative experience of my entire life, traveling behind the Iron Curtain for 10 years, from the late 70s until 1989, meeting the dissidents throughout Central Europe, being able to call Václav Havel my friend. It was utterly inspirational. And what you see here, you see in many places across Europe. There are generations of people who have been inspired by that particular Central European dissident experience and by the way in which you got rid of a dictatorship. So you can look. I went to Burma, I talked to Aung San Suu Kyi. She was reading Havel, she was reading my books, she was reading, it was an inspiration. That 
when I did that at the beginning, that's not just a sort of like the queen waving her hand, you know. That is the sign of support for the protesters in Hong Kong. It's supporting the five demands of the protesters in Hong Kong. My younger son has been writing about the protests in Hong Kong. One of the slogans they painted on the walls was, there is no freedom without solidarity, which is, of course, nie ma wolności bez solidarności. I mean, it's a solidarity slogan. So there's a huge, there's a gift that Central Europe has given to the world of your experience and your transition. Number two, just to pick up on what Tim Snyder said about everyday responsibility, um, Havel, I mean, we could also quote Masaryk, don't lie, don't steal. I agree on that, but I worry when I see Milion Chwilek doing demonstrations which take the entire language of civic activism as if it were back in 1989, rather than doing politics. Because it's great that you're keeping alive that tradition of civic protest, and in Poland too, but actually you live in a democracy. And in a democracy, the key thing you have to do is to win the next bloody election, just as we do, right? So you've got our problems now. So, so let's not, I mean, one of the mistakes of the Havel tradition, it has to be said of anti-politics, was the contempt, or, 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 the, or the, not the contempt, but the, 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 the slight distaste for multi-party politics and the competition for power. That's a perfectly respectable thing. That's what you have to do in a democracy. What we have to do to stop Brexit is to win the next election on the 12th of December. What you have to do here is to win the next election, right? The third thing I want to say, just to take it forward to Europe, is this. When I was traveling across the Iron Curtain throughout the 1980s, I said, concluded at a certain point that Europe was divided between those in Western Europe who had Europe and those in Eastern Europe who believed in it, right? So the really passionate belief in Europe was to be found on this side of the Iron Curtain, not in the West, because we had it already. Now, the trouble is, now we've all got Europe, and so we all had it, but who's left who believes in it, right? So that I see Euroscepticism spreading right across the continent because people take it for granted. So what I want to say is, don't take it for granted. Europe is in danger of gradually falling apart. There is a real danger of the disintegration of the European Union over the next 10 to 20 years. And we need the kind of passion for Europe that you had then because you didn't have it. Now you've got it, but we have to hang on to it. I have a, just... I just have a very brief question regarding the point number two. Isn't it, however, part of democracy, the culture of protest? Isn't it an integral part of democracy as well? Absolutely, of course it is, it's essential. But my point is that, you know, I watched the last big demonstration on Letna and I listened to the language of it. I and mean, as you know, they are very, very carefully saying, we're not gonna get into politics. Well, somebody's got to get into politics and somebody's got to win the bloody election. That, that's my point. Timothy Snyder wanted to react to it, so please, Timothy. I, 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 wanna, make, I wanna make a point about words. So, one of the strongest traditions within East European dissidents, and, and I think within the European 20th century of ideas, is care about words, whether it's Viktor Klemperer in the Third Reich, or whether it's Michał Głowinski in People's Poland, or whether it's, it's Havel, who we've mentioned before. It matters a lot how we say things, as Natalie said, but even some of the little things that we say here, I think begin to distort a bit the, the last 30 years. So the phrase EU enlargement, for example, is a phrase that I don't ever want to hear again because that's just not how it happened. There was not an EU that decided to enlarge. There were East Europeans who spent the better part of 20 years trying to make that a realistic prospect. What would um, you call it? Sorry well, to interrupt. I would what would you call the process? I, I, no, I wouldn't even call it a, see, I'm going to be Joe Humanist. I wouldn't even call it a process. There was no process. Um, the East Europeans came into 1989 with a 
as Tim says, with a kind of spirit, with a kind of idea. Um, you know, when Yizhi Dinspiet wrote a book in the late 80s, he called it, what, Navratka Evropia, right? Return to Europe. There was an idea of a return to Europe, which then was confronted with a set of European community, as it was called then, which had no interest in enlarging at all. It took, it took che Czechoslovakia, as it was then, Hungary and Poland four years to get the European communities to agree on a highly protectionist, unequal, discriminatory, discriminatory set of association agreements, which had, no pro which had no promise of enlargement. It took four more years to get anything like a definition of what it would even mean. I'm looking at you young people in the front row and you're like, how could this have happened? It took as long as you guys have been alive for the European Union to enlarge or, 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 or larger. So my point is that when we say EU enlargement, we're in a way forgetting all of the Europeans in the 1980s who believed in a return to Europe and we're forgetting all of the political work that took place in the 1990s and the 2000s for it to happen, um, because when the problem, there are two, a couple of problems. When someone like Macron, or even we speak about EU enlargement, it's like the EU had a mood one day and it enlarged, and now it has a different mood, right? So it will now do the opposite of enlargement, and I'll try not to be rude about what that would be. Um, so the, the, I, I think the important thing is now to echo, to echo the last couple of points. Um, because the, e the, the growth of the EU was a matter of individual choices among a bunch of different societies, that means that the choices of Hungarians, Czechs, Slovaks, and Poles still have consequences. You could make the EU fall apart or you could create a two-tier EU just as you once were able to join the EU because just as you had agency then, you have agency now, or to put the, the, put the point in a more radical way, the EU is not just a thing that exists. The EU is a product of decisions, and its, its future is therefore open, both in a good sense and in a bad sense. I'm That's thinking, sorry, I'm thinking the process is now, EU is shrinking, isn't it, so to speak, with uh, Britain leaving. That's... That's the process. That's what's happening at the moment. I do not believe that Britain is leaving. Um, I mean, when, when uh, no, I've been saying this for three years, so I'm going to keep saying it till I'm wrong. And I have lots of money writing on this. I do not believe that Britain is leaving. And when Tim says that he doesn't have to defend Brexit and I don't have to defend Trump, um, I mean, he's being very modest because Tim has been working incredibly hard to make the argument against Brexit for almost three years now in a, in a beautiful example of how one can use reason in, in, in politics. But I, I, don't, I wouldn't be casual about Brexit. Um, it's, it is, there are people who are, very, who are doing the kinds of things in Britain that we are talking about now so that Brexit won't happen. And maybe they'll lose, um, but there are millions of people who are, who are doing the best they can. And if Britain does leave the European Union, that will be such an awful tragedy for those, for those islands. So I'm, I, I, I'm not gonna joke about Brexit. I think it would be horrible if it happened. Okay, if Natalie wanted to react. No. I, I suppose I, you were asking about the word, uh, you were raising the question of the word enlargement, and I, I, I know it's, a, it's not a perfect replacement for that word, but I think of it as a process of Europe's unification. I, I, I see it that way. And when I say unification, I don't, I mean, you know, repairing, repairing with, with efforts, with difficulties, with setbacks, but gradually, gradually repairing this great divide that we suffered in Europe uh, uh, all that time. And I think it's not over. It's a process that is still uh, running its course with, yes, discouragements, disappointments, frustrations, but I think it is, it is going to continue. I think my, perhaps my whole life it's going to continue. Uh, I was in Ukraine not long ago, and I can tell you there are people who are, you know, they see themselves as part of Europe and they will be part of Europe, uh, as they will be part of the European structures one day. For me, it's obvious the European Union will probably, you know, morph into this kind of multifaceted structures, combination of structures. But for me, it's clear that um, Europe's unification is not over and it, it, it will continue. Uh, 
it's the it's because essentially because young people want it, you know. Yeah. Yep. Let's stay. Um, <laughs> let's stay with you for a while. Um, I would like to quote two uh, two lines of uh, Timothy Snyder. Uh, first one, uh, your speech in Cambridge a few months ago when you said, and I quote, if Europe weaves a false story about itself, it won't be able to face up to what's lurking beyond its realm. And then a few months later uh, in Vienna on Judenplatz, uh, in your speech, you added, and I quote again, you are more than your myth, you meaning Europeans. And I, I can't wait to hear your explanation. What false story do you see? And what are the myths that we Europeans believe in? Okay. Take your time. So this, no is, this is the part where I really do get to be an outsider. So normally people say, oh, you're an American. You're an outsider. Tell us what... Eastern Europe looks like from America, to which the answer is no one is looking. Um, but but uh, <laughs> um, um, but whereas I don't I don't feel like an outsider. I feel like someone who's spent a lot of his adult life here and who has friends here and who tries to understand things here. But in this interpretation, I am an outsider. Um, but I think it's, I think what I'm about to say is right and, and bears some thinking because it, it directly connects to this question of what Europe is and does it have a future. So the myth of Europe goes like this. And if you've ever had any contact with any European institution and listen to any representative of any European institution holding a microphone, you have heard this myth. The myth is... There was a Second World War. It was very bad. Europeans understood that it was bad. And therefore, they decided peace would be better. And so they began to trade in coal and steel. And from there grew the idea that more trade would be better and we should trade in more things. And then there would be more peace. And that worked. Okay. So, that is the myth. Um, I don't think I'm doing it undue violence. It is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous story. It's the kind of story that was perhaps okay to believe during the Cold War with, or when the Americans were present or when you were recovering from the Second World War, but it is a dangerous thing to believe now. Why is it so dangerous? It's dangerous because it hides from you what the European integration process has actually done, which is save you as nations and as states. And by you, I mean all of you. I mean the United Kingdom, which without the European Union, God forbid, will cease to exist. Um, I mean the Czech Republic, I mean everything in between. The big question in European history is, what do you do after empire? That is the question that is so much more important than any other in European history. That is the question. And the answer, the successful answer, the hugely, surprisingly, wonderfully successful answer to that question is the European Union. That's what the European Union is. No one around the world has found an answer to the question of what to do after empire, except you. You specialists in empire have also come up with the, with the answer to the question, what to do after empire. The myth of Europe says, we were a bunch of nation states, we had this war, it was bad, and so we decided not to have those wars anymore. The truth is, at the time of the Second World War, Great Britain was an empire, the Netherlands was an empire, France was an empire, Belgium was an empire, Italy was trying to become an empire, and Germany was trying to become an empire. The name of international politics was still empire. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, as those empires ceased to exist, European integration was built up as a substitute. 
Europeans never learned that war was a bad thing. Europeans kept fighting them until they lost them. The Dutch in Indochina, the Belgians in Congo, the British here, there, and everywhere, the French in Algeria and Southeast, in, in, in Southeast Asia, right? This idea that Europeans stopped fighting after the Second World War is Eurocentric and simply not true. Europeans stopped fighting when they lost enough times or when the Americans stopped funding it, okay? So the European Union, therefore, has the story of the European Union has to be told simultaneously with the story of decolonization because they happened at the same time, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, so the European Union is where you get an imperially sized economy without an imperial style political system. And the remarkable thing for me about the European Union is that it brings different kinds of post-imperial pieces together. It brings together former pieces of former land empires. It brings together the, the metropolitan remains of former maritime empires. And it brings together the, po the, the, the westward parts of the Soviet empire. That is a remarkable thing to have achieved. But this is so important because it makes the history of Europe much grander than the myth, right? The problem with you people is that your myth is less grand than your history. For it everyone, be the other way around. For everyone it? else, it's the other way around, right? Um, your history is a history of the world, and the history of the European Union is of the creation of a new kind of political instrument, one which, unlike empires and unlike nation states that know they're small and the ones that don't know they're small, has a future, right? If you see the, Europe, the history of the European Union this way, you can think, what could a big, interesting unit like this do in the future? If your story is the European Union was just there to make peace after the Second World War among, among a bunch of nation states, well, understandably, if you're 20, you could say, well, that history seems to me to be over. That was a while ago, right? But if the, if the point of the European Union is to create an answer to the question, what to do after empire? How can you have a non-imperial, anti-imperial, free form of politics, which also allows you to be prosperous in the 21st century? Then you've got something the Chinese don't have. Then you have something that Americans don't have. Then you may have the beginnings of the kind of system which can address the big questions like global warming or like digital politics in a way which is better than the Chinese and the Americans are doing. So this, from my point of view, the stakes of getting I mean, not only recommended history, from my point of view, the stakes of getting history right here are very, very, very high. So when, nearly 30 years ago, Tim Snyder was our student at Oxford, he used to give these brilliant seminar presentations, and you've just heard one of them. <laughs> a fantastic mini lecture, the thesis is extremely persuasive. I just make, you know, the, the way that people do at Oxford, make tiny qualifications, which is, if you turn to me, Tim, or turn to Natalie, then it would be absolutely right because we were the most frightful imperialists all over the world, as you said. But I am trying to remember the last time Czech imperialism had a great moment, right? Never. <laughs> so I think, I think we should leave, leave the Czechs out of that post-imperial story, perhaps. Uh, absolve you from that charge. But, but, but I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with the central thesis. I want to say something which connects to that. And if I can start by disconcerting the interpreters by saying, Litvo ty jesteś jak zdrowie, ile ci trzeba cenić ten tylko się który cię stracił. Which is, of course, the most famous lines of Adam Mickiewicz, Lithuania, thou art like health, how much we should value you, they alone know who have lost you. It is no accident that the two biggest 
pro-European mobilizations in the last 10 years in Europe have been in Ukraine, which hasn't yet got Europe, and in the UK, my country, which is about to lose it, right? So that you have massive pro-European, but that's very problematic if the condition for a real pro-European mobilization is either not to get to have Europe or to be about to lose it, then Europe is not in a very good way in terms of popular support. So I think there's a real problem there in terms of the emotional engagement with Europe. And let me say one other thing, which is, I mean, I agree very much with what Tim said about enlargement, but nonetheless, the fact is, because the Czech Republic and Slovakia and Hungary and Poland very much wanted to get into the EU. The EU had fantastic transformative power. I mean, you all remember this. You made so many changes. Everything was changed to get into the EU. As soon as you get into the EU, it turns out that you can do whatever you like. You can get away with murder, colloquially speaking. And Viktor Orban is the classic example of this, right? Viktor Orban has been systematically dismantling a liberal democracy in Hungary, not just while Hungary is a member state of the European Union, but using for that purpose European funds, European taxpayers' money, so that there is something... There's, the EU is, in a really important sense, malfunctioning. Instead of strengthening democracies in its member states, it's actually contributing to the weakening of democracy in several of its member states. So in my book, there's a quite concrete thing we have to do in the next few years, which is to make sure the EU actually does what people in this country dreamed of it doing, namely to be the promoter and guarantor of European values of freedom and democracy and human rights and the rule of law. Because at the moment, Viktor Orban is using it to do the opposite, and I think Andrei Babish and Milos Zeman are not so far behind. Question to you, Milan. Uh, I would like to hear your view on what uh, Timothy has just said on the fact that the malfunctioning of the EU is actually weakening the member states and not the other way around. Uh, yeah, well, I <clears throat> a little bit enjoyed uh, Timothy warning that Europe is in real danger, saying it in Prague, in most uh, anti-European country in the in the European Union. There's some competition. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well, we, well I, I hope this it's not the, the, this this uh, public not, but but Czechs are actually this is this is another topic. How how could this possibly happen? But. Um, uh, when I was listening to that, yes, uh, I still think that we, well, actually remembering the lessons from NG9, we still have something to offer to West because uh, we know how is it when something collapses. Um, yeah, the communism collapsed and we wished for that, so it was nice, but nevertheless, it was collapsed, nobody expected. So, in this sense, the experience of that collapse, which was not accepted, um, is just, uh, very right to say Europe Union can collapse as well. Nobody expected that. The difference that nobody actually wished for that, unlike in communists, but we had another collapse in Czechoslovakia, the state collapsed uh, in 92, and nobody wished for that, or majority definitely did not and still did collapse. So we, we can talk to, I mean, our experience of collapse is something which we should warn us. The problem I see is that the public today, I mean, younger generation doesn't at all uh, uh, understand that because they are born afterwards. But even, even we don't talk about that as we forget this lesson. We forget that this, and, and not only that it can collapse, something cannot, but it collapses very fast. Um, and so, and I think in the West, it's completely forgotten that lesson because it's just what 70 years. So, I mean, difficulties are not talking about only the danger, but also about you know, um, well, we can talk about that. Please just come to your sense because this we know how it is. I mean, it can collapse very fast in 10 days uh, and or in a couple of months. 
but the thing is, of course, that um, I, I think that the warning itself uh, doesn't, uh, is not enough. Um, you are right, Timothy, that in, in, in Britain now they are the biggest defenders of, uh, of European and, and uh, on the other hand, when we look at that uh, uh, Central Europe like uh, Orban and Hungary and, and, and Poland, the fact is that despite these politicians attack European and all the time, the Hungarians and the Poles are the most of Euro optimistic people in in European Union, and that I still believe in that that uh, in a mo which is not the case of Britain. So in the case when when uh, there will be a danger, I'm quite sure that uh, Orbán and Kaczynski will lose it if they go against uh, European Union, and people will feel that oh now it is for real, it could collapse. So that I th I do believe. But if that I mean, people will, will defend it, especially, as Natalie said, the young people. I, I totally agree with that. Just one sentence. You know, Boris Johnson, please boo at this point. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Boris Johnson famously said that his attitude to cake was pro-having it and pro-eating it. He wants to have a cake and eat it. The result is that he will neither have his cake nor eat it. The person who has his cake and eats it is Viktor Orban. He fights an election campaign, stop Brussels against the European Union, and meanwhile underpins his own rule, and by the way, his personal wealth and power with funds from the EU. So that's my point, that we can't let people get away with, with having their yeah, cake yeah, and eating agree, it. Agree, agree, of course. You're right. I have to say, this could be a great political meme with Viktor Orban and Keg, who's, who's he's having it and eating it at the same time. Just to suggestion, it could be a political meme. <laughs> um, <laughs> just a suggestion. Um, I just uh, wanted to go back to what Timothy Snyder said in the quote Katarina used just a few minutes ago. Um, you you talked about. Uh, dangers that are lurking beyond Europe's realm. Um, that reminded me something that uh, Czech-American historian Igor Lukesh says. And he says that the, the biggest threat of danger is no longer exclusively an outside force that is lurking behind the, the realm, but something's happening inside people's minds and maybe hearts, some kind of fear, some kind of doubt about things which we considered um, stable and, and proven and, and, and so on. Do you agree with this point of view? Uh, I'm going to have my cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. So it's both true that there are outside threats to the European Union. I mean, to be quite specific, you, you have a direct Eastern neighbor, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Lithuania, have a direct Eastern neighbor which, whose foreign policy is to destroy the European Union. But the way that the Russian Federation tries to destroy the European Union is not mainly an old fashioned clash of military power. It is mainly inside the mind, as, as Professor Lukash suggests. What, what the Russians face is a world where their traditional sources of power are rather weak. They have a small economy. Um, you know, you can pick a European country and complain about its economy, but then it will turn out that its economy is doing better than the Russian one and is bigger than the Russian one. Um, but what they have managed to do is, despite a position of weakness in traditional power, they've managed to come up with a kind of untraditional power. They've managed in a way to turn their own weakness into a strength. Their weakness is um, they have not done all of the things that we are talking about. They have not created the rule of law. They have not created the democracy. Um, they haven't had tremendous economic growth, which is something we haven't mentioned, but which most of our countries have had. They, they have failed in the traditional criteria of what you call the transition at the beginning. And their response has been to say, well, you know what, those things don't really matter very much and who knows anyway and are we really sure that the rule of law is quite so objective and are we sure that other democracies also aren't managed and maybe those reporters in those other countries are also quite corrupt and by the way, what is truth? 
anyway? And how can you be sure? And so by little steps, you move from one kind of power to another kind of power, which is a psychic power. Because of course, none of us is perfect and our systems aren't perfect. And um, I'm willing to admit that Natalie's early work as a journalist in Czechoslovakia was not perfect, although you know the later stuff is all perfect. None, none of us is perfect. None of our systems is perfect. And so this, this foreign policy of critique, which says you're just as bad as we are, and we're pretty bad, right? <laughs> um, that has a certain effect. And it's not just that it works inside our souls. I mean, I've watched so much Russian television that I'm sure there has been damage to whatever soul I have. Um, but it, it begins to work in other more obvious levels. It begins to work on our oligarchs as our own oligarchs mingle with Russian oligarchs and as they trade techniques. It works on our far right as our own far right goes online with the Russian state and trades memes precisely and learns new techniques. And it works on our politicians, the ones who directly or indirectly accept help. Um, both the campaign for Brexit and the campaign to elect Mr. Trump involved very obvious Russian foreign policy. And then when they succeed in getting a person or a question inside a system, then the chaos and the uncertainty goes to a higher level. Now that Mr. Trump is president, Americans have even better reasons to wonder, is our rule of law perfect? Is our democracy perfect? Um, is our, is, 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 are, do we have enough journalists? And so when you get to that state of uncertainty, um, you can then make the mistake of saying, well, right, who knows? Maybe it is all a joke. Right? Maybe, maybe there are no facts, maybe there, maybe there is no truth. So yes, I mean, there is an external actor that is trying to destroy the European Union, but the main way that it tries to do so is by magnifying, exaggerating, casting doubts, giving you excuses not to do the kinds of things we've been talking about. Maybe question for other... The same question for other panelists. Do you agree with it that there are two main factors? One of them is outside forces, and the other one is the representation of the outside force, which is, has a consequence for the way how people feel about the world and how they see the world. Can I just follow directly on what Tim said so eloquently about Russia? Because I agree with everything he said about Russia, but it seems to me at least as important also to talk about China by far the biggest unintended and unforeseen consequence of what happened in 1989 is the Chinese state we have today. Remember, on the 4th of June, 1989, on the 3rd of June, 1989, the Chinese communist world and the Soviet communist world were utterly comparable. It was possible to imagine either of them going many ways. On the 4th of June, 1989, you had the first semi-free election in Poland that gave us the first non-communist prime minister in Eastern Europe, Tadeusz Mazowiecki. And the same day, the very same day, I remember seeing this on a television screen in Warsaw, you had the Tiananmen Square massacre. And the two worlds diverged, and the Chinese Communist Party leaders deliberately learned their lessons from the collapse of communism and the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, don't make their mistakes. We're gonna, not gonna let our regime collapse like they did and produce something we hadn't seen before, which one might call in shorthand, Leninist capitalism, right? Leninist capitalism, not something we imagined in 1989. And this is now doing two things. I mean, it has a bunch of problems, a bunch of internal tensions and even contradictions, which anyone who studied the history of Leninism uh, would expect. But for now, it's made an incredibly dynamic country, and this has two effects. Number one, that whereas in the 1990s, Francis Fukuyama was right in his basic thesis that liberal democracy did not have a global, transnational, transcultural, ideological competitor, you know, every bar philosopher you meet says Fukuyama was wrong. He was right in the 1990s, but now we have such a competitor. Uh, if you look at China and the West from the point of view of Latin America or Africa, 
you know the West looks in quite a mess and China looks quite attractive. But the second thing is that as much as Russia is undermining and dividing and ruling in the European Union, so also increasingly is China, and you in the Czech Republic are actually one of the frontline states, along with Hungary, of the Chinese attempt to penetrate the European Union. You have a president who says he wants uh, the Czech Republic to be an unsinkable aircraft carrier for Chinese inward investment. You've just had this great scandal about Chinese funding to the universities. And because of the nature of the European Union, because as Tim rightly says, it is the world's most advanced example of a non-imperial empire, what that means is if you can get a European prime minister on your side, you've got a seat at the decision-making table of the EU. So I actually think, particularly here in the Czech Republic, if I may say so, you have to watch out as much for Chinese influence as you do for Russian. Yes. I am happy that the two bad cops, the usual suspects, China and Russia, have been finally mentioned. It took us some hour, but it's it, Natalie. I, w I wanted to add uh, a thought about, um, about China. I I've spent uh, perhaps uh, approximately 15 years of my life uh, looking at Russia, and I've watched uh, Putin's uh, rise, and so I, have, I could talk to you a lot about uh, Russia and how... Um, how basically I think we should support the young people in Russia who've been demonstrating a lot uh, over the summer. Uh, and there is more pushback than we generally acknowledge. And I, I wanted to mention that because, uh, uh, Tim, you, Timothy, you just said um, uh, China seems attractive, you know, because it, it got its, it's, it's got its sort of authoritarian ca capitalism that seems to work. It has high growth rates, etc. I'm not, well, I, 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 I take that point, but I, I'm not sure China is today a very attractive place. When you look at the events in Hong Kong and you see that these, these young people for now seven months have been demonstrating to try to protect rights that they thought were uh, guaranteed and uh, that they, they see uh, are deeply threatened. Um, and. Um, I think, I think for us Europeans, and perhaps especially in, here in Prague and in Luzerna and with the Havel's message also about China, uh, I think it's important for us to keep an eye on that wider picture. Indeed, China is important and China's game uh, and strategy that co concerns us. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really a battle about, it's not just a battle about contracts and which politician is corrupt or, you know, or lobbyists in Brussels. It's really about what is, what is the, what is our capacity as Europeans to be part of a global conversation that has to do with defending f some fundamental principles. And, um, you know, many, many times it's been said that the European project is like a, Kant's garden, you know, a, a beautiful place with uh, order and peace. Uh, and uh, it, we know it's more complicated than that. If we've learned something in these 30 years, and certainly we learned it pretty fast with the Yugoslav wars, is that it's not that simple, right? The European project is not, uh, uh, I said, I'm confident about Europe's unification. I also am aware, I'm not a complete dreamer, I'm aware of the difficulties that we're facing. We have war on the continent in eastern Ukraine. Uh, we've had the experience of the Yugoslav wars. Well, the Balkans is still a very weak underbelly of our, of our part of uh, the world. Um, but it's, it's, I'm going to repeat my point about being obsessed with European unity. Um, because we do live in a world where everything is connected, that the battles that are the political battles in Hong Kong will affect us. Just like in 89, and Timothy, you mentioned it, indeed, the events of Tiananmen had a huge impact on what happened in our part of the world because Gorbachev watched the repression and reportedly decided that there would be no repression in Central Europe as people were demonstrating and the, the push, the push for change was happening. Uh, Honecker 
in East Germany wanted repression and uh, uh, he had to back down because Moscow and Gorbachev did not want this to happen. So everything's connected even more today than, than back then, I think. And for our European unity, and this is why I wanted to say I actually like the name uh, Respect. I, I like the name Respect. I think it's a great, I, I, I know that journalists have to be uh, pushy and sometimes unpleasant, but I like the name Respect because I think this is what we need within our societies and also across Europe. Um, we have to learn much more about each other. We, we're not doing that enough in our media organizations. I, I worked for many years in French media organizations. Now I'm working in a British media organization and I can see that even in the very quality, you know, ambitious, prestigious media organizations, we are still not uh, looking enough at our European complexities, diversities, hopes, uh, heroes, etc. So I would dream of a European respect, something that would be, you know, not just for a Czech, uh, a Czech audience or a Slovak audience, but really something that would, you know, uh, be even some kind of collective European respect, where you would have journalists from all over Europe that would participate in a new digital platform, where we would value that work, that word respect, and I'll, I'll end on this, because I think that one of the failures of journalists in the last, and journalists have many qualities, of course, but one of the failures of journalists is that, um, you know, if, if Trump has shown, the, the, the rise of Trump has shown us something, uh, the phenomenon of Brexit has shown us something, and the gilets jaunes, the yellow vests in France has shown us something. It is that even our quality media organizations are not paying enough attention. They're not, you know, not respecting, but listening enough to, to people. And uh, the, the previous panel was really extraordinary because you could see that there are journalists that, in respect who are doing this, who are going out there who are listening to people, and it's so important to show, to listen, and to show respect. It, it, you can disagree, of course, you can completely disagree, but we lose something that is really precious when we when we start to think that because somebody disagrees with you, then you know he's just he can be ignored. You can you, you don't need to pay that much respect to that person. I'll stop there. Natalie, Natalie mentioned that journalists should be pushy and be where this is master talking. I just remind you of the fact you may not know that Natalie had so pushy and hard and pertinent questions and she has to be um, taken away from uh, uh, Bernard Kushner reception, is it so? When she was still working um, as a journalist for Le Monde. Natalie, tell us this. Uh, you, you must have found this on a Wikipedia web page somewhere, right? Um, <laughs> but, not yeah. sure. Oh, it's, tr it's true, it's, it's a tiny anecdote, it's not really important. I was blacklisted by the French Foreign Ministry around eight, about 10 years ago, and that's because, yes, I was probably asking um, too many pushy questions, but um, they apologized and they put me back on the, blacklisted meaning that I, the, the, the foreign minister decided that I would not be invited to press briefings anymore. And at the time I worked for Le Monde, and I'm very grateful that the Le Monde editor completely, of course, defended me and said, you know, uh, she will continue to, you know, she needs to have access. And so I was, I was protected. And, I, and I, you know, basically my little story is not really interesting, but what's interesting is that we in Europe have to protect the freedom of the press, and this is what Respect is, 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 has been doing, and in Poland, Gazeta Wyborcza, and you know, in Hungary, there's a huge need uh, for uh, support to journalists who are trying to do their job in very, very difficult circumstances. Um, and I, I remember earlier this year, I read a report from the Council of Europe, uh, one of the entities of the Council of Europe, and it said that Today in Europe, the wide, the wide continent, uh, freedom of the press is, is under threat like, like never before since the end of the Cold War. And th this, this, has to, this has to worry us. Europe is not in a completely safe place for the freedom of the press. 
we will elaborate on, on the media freedom uh, or media freedom uh, uh, in a while, but I want to stay with the European issue for with you now. Um, after uh, this year's um, European elections, and that's how you were quite optimistic um, when you saw results, and then you wrote, and I quote, perhaps there is more common sense and moderation than we feared in Europe's political landscape. Um, I wanted to ask you on what you base your your optimism. What do you think it's the biggest um, biggest value? Because one can one one could argue that there is a new divide popping um, uh, in Europe, which is the ecological divide, since uh, quite many of the so-called Eastern European states. Um, and they would contest the fact that we should fight climate change and it's the biggest ever threat now um, uh, facing Europe. I, I would, uh, just on that question of uh, people's attitudes in Central Europe to the question of climate change, I'd, I'd be curious to see some data on that. What, what do people, some, some governments maybe are not ent enthusiastic about, you know, certain measures, like in Poland, the Polish government is not enthusiastic about winding down coal production or things like that. But I, I'd be curious to see exactly what, you know, citizens think about that. I think. Uh, the ecological question is something that a large number of Europeans everywhere are, are thinking about and worried about. Um, I'm trying to remember the first part of your question, which was... Uh, On what you base your optimism. I, uh, thanks. Um, I would like to see I some think, more optimism, I, I think my I think my, um, my point was there were so many... in. In, in the Anglo-American press, there were so many negative headlines and, you know, uh, pessimistic headlines about Europe in the run-up to these European Parliament elections in May that uh, I thought it was important to highlight that these were not the absolute, they were not fully reassuring, but they were not the absolute political catastrophe that many people had predicted. And sitting in London and also seeing how often we continental Europeans are uh, listening to many comments about Europe that are made from the, you know, British press where I work, so I'm not going to criticize, you know, where I work uh, too much, but uh, also the American media. And there's been, as a result of Brexit and Trump, there's been a kind of uh, doom and gloom about Europe, about Europe's prospects, about the very possibility that the European project would continue to survive, that I think this doom and gloom, which is very, actually very self-centered on Britain's Brexit problem and America's Trump problem, has actually um, influenced us a little bit too much on the continent about how we should think about our, our common project. So I'm not saying we should disconnect ourselves from the debates in, in Britain and, and, and the, the US, but I, I remember being in the US uh, uh, sometime last year at a conference, and there was a very, quite a famous British analyst of populism who was speaking. And he, he was telling this American audience, it was uh, in the, on the East Coast, he was telling this American audience of really highly educated, smart people, that the European project was just like going to the dogs, you know, that it was dying on its feet. And he was showing all these statistics. And, um, and I, I thought how, how dangerous this is that, you know, even as, as, as Timothy was saying, not many people in, Washington, at least these days, are looking at Europe uh, the way they should be looking at it. But even in a, in a sort of educated uh, environment, you have some British analysts telling the Americans that the European project is dead. And uh, this, uh, to answer your question, my point was, let's, let's not be, you know, uh, over pessimistic. Let's be realistic. Um, and to solve our problems, we have to work on that unity. And the unity comes from better understanding of each other, because in fact, we still don't really know each other enough in Europe. Timothy, you wanted to react to it, please. Okay, I wanted to just echo a couple of Natalie's points. The, the, on, the earlier, on the earlier question, um, 
uh, one of the things that Europe could really use if Europe was going to have this kind of European public sphere, which I think Natalie's calling for, would be a, a European history. So like, e e I teach European history to Europeans in North America and in Europe, and it's striking how Europe, yeah, you're laughing, right? It's, it's funny. Um, it's striking how balkanized, you know, or it's, it's striking how, um, how fragmented and contradictory Europeans' knowledge of European history is. It's, it's, it's one thing where the U.S. actually has more of a self-understanding than Europeans do, shocking though that might be. Um, the trend in Europe is towards something called memory, and memory is not a branch of history. Memory is a way of suffocating history. When you, when you establish national institutes which, whose, whose mission, whose political mission is to prove that you are innocent and everyone else is guilty, that's not a step towards history, that's a step away from history. And I don't say that just as a moralizing historian. I, I'm talking about this politically because if there isn't a sense of common European history, where people in Estonia have some idea about the Carnation Revolution in Portugal and people in Spain have some idea about famine in Ukraine. If there isn't some kind of common history, then every little thing that happens in the present is all that much harder to understand and every little crisis becomes, becomes much worse. So I think, I mean, like in any friendship, there has to be a past to the friendship. The friendship can't start anew every time. A friendship has to have a past and I think Boring though it sounds, I, going back to the very first question, I think one of the things that should have happened after 1989 but didn't was the construction of a very basic common European history curriculum. I think if that had happened, we would be in a different place right now. And then on, on, this, on this issue of optimism, I, again, I just wanted to echo and amplify Natalie's point. I was really struck by this because in the run-up to the last European parliamentary elections, it was striking to me how often Europeans were just repeating your enemy's propaganda, which, you know, repeating your own propaganda is bad enough, but repeating your enemy's propaganda is a sign that things have really gone wrong. And, and this, this particular story, which has an American version and a British version and a Russian version, but this story that the EU is unnatural, that the EU must be on the way out, that there's some kind of objective logic that makes it impossible, whether that's a logic of demography or whether that's a logic that only the nation state is real. Um, whatever the logic is, that is the propaganda of your enemies. And it's, it, it's, I find it astonishing that you, so many, not you personally, because you're all wonderful people, I know, but I find it astonishing how often Europeans repeat this, and that in the news coverage of the parliamentary elections, it was as though the only theme was, are we about to commit suicide, right? Not, how are we going to live a long, wonderful life starting tomorrow, but are we about to commit suicide? And, and when the answer to that question turns out to be no, it's like the story is over. But there, it's not just that nothing bad happens, it's that good things happen, right? The rise of the Greens in European politics isn't just good in itself, it is a sign that there is actually a single European political conversation which is emerging, which people in Switzerland, Austria, Germany, and elsewhere have similar views about. So I, I worry a lot that when it's not just that not every bad thing happens, it's as though too many Europeans have a taste only for the bad things. Um, and, and that that's a way that you know, we Americans and, and, and Russians and so on are getting under your skin. Um, there has to be a taste for the good things which can happen as well. And a lot of good things can happen. Well, it's difficult to... Um um, well, I, because I agree with everything that you have said. I mean, it's just uh, now, I mean... Please don't. Uh, I try to... But I, I have to say that, you know, I remember as a journalist, um, nothing was more boring to write than to write about European Union 15 years ago. I mean, nothing was more boring. Nobody read it. Uh, I know. Whether, whether uh, good or bad, the fact is that the debate about Europe already exists now, finally. And people are interested in that 
whatever they think about it. So first of all, what you need is start a debate, <laughs> and that's happening. So what, that's one thing I, I think is a positive. But it was struck by tragedy uh, or crisis, well, then, as it was uh, yeah, pointed out yes. by Timothy Gordon. But it's Nash. not only Brexit. It, well, European elections were about uh, Europe. First time, probably, in, in the history of European elections, it was a real debate about Europe, even in the countries like Slovakia, which, you know, had no idea what... But it was, it was about Europe. It was interesting. Uh, uh, thank, thank goodness, and actually, I was, I know, I mean, it's, it's only instinct, but I was much wor more worried about um, the collapse of Europe Union about when, than Greece uh, crisis. We didn't know, actually, how the Europe would react on that, and I was scared, because it seemed to be really on the edge. I mean, it could collapse any time, I mean, Eurozone, whatever. Well, look at that. I mean, Greece is a fantastic example of not only survived the crisis, not only didn't Europe collapse on that, but Greece is now the example of the, I mean, democratic uh, state which survived the deepest crisis in, in decades. And they didn't, and their democracy didn't collapse, their trust in European didn't collapse. So, I mean, you have the signs you, that you can, you, 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 there is a reason for optimism. Another one is, and it sounds negative, but uh, to what Timothy says, I mean, of course you're right. I mean. But China is a huge threat to European, not talking about Russia, we know about that. Actually, that was one of the lessons we should, we should give to the West from 89, talking about bad, bad Russians, and that, but West didn't listen, that was another thing. Um, uh, yes, but the thing is that, um, uh, again, when Fukuyama was again right, but also in 1991, but the thing was that the West in that time um, lost its mirror from the challenge which was Soviet Union. I mean, it was ideological challenge which made Westerners uh, behave better than otherwise, otherwise they would do because they needed in competition to be better than the, than the other challenge. So I think, well, the threat it is here, but if we recognize the threat, that, and it is a big threat, we need to be better, otherwise we will not win in that competition. Better than Chinese communist capitalism. So again, from the threat can, can come something positive if we recognize it, of course. And I, and I think, you know, if you look at that, well, it's, it's happening. At least Europeans have started to understand that there is a real threat. I mean, five years ago, nobody would uh, be able to convince Western Europeans that Russia could be bad after annexation of Crimea. It's obvious. I mean, and that's, that's the process. So all these things um, gives me, give me optimism, which I don't say it will, it will be fine, but we have, the, we have the chance. And I see it as a bigger, uh, I can only say that it's, it's my own instinct. Ten years ago, I was much more frustrated about the future of European Union as I am as I'm today, just because it's, now it's finally we are talking about it, not only in this panel. Let me pick up on two, two of these points. Um, first of all, memory and history. Um, one of my favorite comments about memory it comes from Homer Simpson in The Simpsons. And uh, he says uh, at one point, uh, he says, well, everything looks bad if you remember it. <laughs> a, a great comment. So, so now in, in East Central Europe, we have countries that establish institutes of national memory whose main purpose is to remember all the good things and forget all the bad ones. So they should be called institutes of national forgetting. Um, but uh, the, the challenge, I mean, it's part of the challenge Tim was talking about, which is to try to bring together the very different national memories. But the other challenge is the intergenerational challenge. So I have a big project now at Oxford trying to work with the generation which I call the post 1989 there's probably some in this room, people born between 1980 and 2000 who are, is it, were, who, who, who are living in, in, in the post-war world, the post-1989 world. And the challenge there is, can people really get to learn from history, from a bad history, without having to go through it themselves? That's the challenge, because from 1945, 
until the early 1990s, the pro-European case in every single European country was different than it looked on the first glance. It had the same basic form, which was, we have been in a bad place, we want to be in a better place, that place is called Europe, right? So there was no shortage of bad places in Europe. Uh, communist dictatorship, fascist dictatorship, war, genocide, holocaust, collaboration. But the basic shape of the argument was we remember being in a bad place, we want to be in a better one, and it's called Europe. Now you have a generation of Europeans who have never known the bad place. And the question is, can we historians and journalists and novelists and filmmakers actually convey that lesson with sufficient urgency that this thing, wonderful as it is in many ways, is still very fragile and could actually go back into our bad old ways very quickly indeed. The Polish romantic poet Cyprian Novid has a wonderful fragment in a letter where he says, um, Europe is a drunk old woman and mad woman um, who every few years goes back to mass killing and murder. And, and there's a sort of the basic truth in that, that, that poetic insight. And so the case for Europe has to be made not just from everything we sound, feel so wonderful about it, like, you know, free roaming and no data roaming charges, all that stuff, but also from the sense of what Macron calls the tragique l'histoire, the fragility of this thing, that it can fall back any time. So that's one point about Europe, memory and history. The other point, very quickly, is this. The great generation of leaders of Central Europe, Václav Havel, Bronisław Geremek, and others, one of the big lessons they brought to us in Western Europe was about the West. They actually gave us a new term, the Euro-Atlantic community, which isn't a term we'd used. Now, as Tim rightly said, this has dramatically disappeared. When's the last time you heard people talking about the West? Can you remember the last time people talked about the West in a geopolitical context? As Tim said, it's not just that Americans don't even look at Eastern Europe. Americans hardly look at Europe at all. Um, unthinkable in the Cold War, but I, I spent the last three years at Stanford. I hardly heard Europe mentioned. It hardly features. I was just at the celebrations for the fall of the Berlin Wall. Tributes were paid left, right, and center, Gorbachev, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic. The United States, France, and Britain hardly got a mention in what used to be West Berlin. In other words, the West, the Euro-Atlantic community, is seeking to exist. And I think this is something really that is re very, very important, because the fact is the challenge of climate change, the challenge of, climate, uh, of China, the challenge of artificial intelligence and uh, uh, internet that is used for repression, these are challenges which require the combined effort of Europe and North America to meet them. And at the moment, if we abandon any notion of the West of a transatlantic community, then instead of hanging together, we're going to hang separately. We tackled... Thank you. We tackled this uh, topic several times already, but we still would like to discuss it further. Timothy Snyder mentioned or dedicated his book, The Road to Unfreedom, to, as he said previously, reporters, the heroes of our time. And our question tonight is, are we still heroes of our time? Or have we become, so to speak, enemy of the people? And I will ask Milan first to answer this question. Ah. Well, you know, it's, um, there is a huge paradox uh, coming from Slovakia. Uh, that the uh, journalist were, was murdered with his girlfriend. And until then, uh, media in Slovakia were a little bit like everywhere else, not very much trusted, kind of, and politicians hated them, and they used the hatred to media for their own purpose, being more popular. Um, and this is a paradox. The journalists were murdered, and in Slovakia now, it, lead, it led to a journalistic revolution, actually. What is happening today, 
not only that there were huge demonstrations where journalists were on the tribunes, celebrated like heroes, which is fascinating. I never seen anything like that. Uh, there were journalists standing on the tribune and, and, just, and the crowd was just uh, applauding them. Uh, but the other thing is that what happened now is Slovakia is now under, well, one is, another thing is that it's a huge shock. But thanks to a journalist, journalist uh, they, uh, people discover the horror of which, which preceded that murder. Where, and the, then the mafianization of the state, deep, deep state, in a, in a combined with, with mafia. Uh, and so and the journalists are those who bring it to the public. And again, now, no, I mean, of course, some politicians say it, of course, and again and again. But I never in my life uh, have seen such a, a, not only trust, but also a kind of a, a good um, attitude to the journalists from the public. Not from all public, of course, but, uh, but it's much more, it's very different from the past. How do you explain so, that? Hmm? How do you explain this? this well, when the fact one thing is a murder, the other is um, the people now know, they understand that without that media, they wouldn't do any, they wouldn't know. So, um, and it's a, it's a fascinating experience, uh, again, which, which I never believed I would, I would uh, live again. Uh, politicians are scared of media. They are really scared because they don't know what the next day will come again uh, on the surface about, about their past. So it's just an example. Maybe, maybe it's not, um, maybe it's just, the situation is maybe too special because of this murder and because the Slovak media are actually still quite free, or part of them. But at least you see the example, what can media do if they are free, or at least some of them, and, and if there is a, such a disaster that the state is in such a phase of, uh, and stage of corruption, and media can defend the public against the, against the politicians, and it, and it it works. Of course, you will see how it will work in the elections in February next year. I'm mean, not sure. But, but the experience of, of that is fascinating for me. I never thought I would, I would uh, have that experience again. It was last I had it was in Mecha's time in the 90s, actually. So in this case, if you want to listen to some optimistic story, just go to Slovakia. Mm -hmm. Before we all go, um, a question to Natalie, as she's in um, the position, um, an exclusive position that you were uh, um, at the top of a French Daily, but also you a member of the editorial board of a British Daily, The Guardian. Um, now, a common man might say that everyone with a smartphone is a journalist now because he or she witnesses what's happening and can report on it directly. So, what you as a representative of the so-called traditional media, what role do you see for media like The Guardian, like Le Monde? And I would like to mention respect. I dare to mention respect as a traditional media. Thank you. Of course. Well, you know, just one thing comes to mind, and, and it's, some, it's not something that anybody can do from his smartphone. Um, there was a, there is a, a journalist who worked for The Observer, which is the weekly of, attached to The Guardian, and this, was a, a, this is a young woman who worked uh, almost alone on a particular story. Uh, she was even, uh, I think, a freelancer at the time, and, but the editor of the newspaper said to her, yeah, continue, continue to look into that, you know, and so she worked for maybe one year with absolutely, you know, no visible results, but she was digging, she was digging on a particular story. And this is uh, the woman who broke the, uh, the, the scoop about uh, Cambridge Analytica, uh, Carol Cadwallader, her name is, um, and she is She's just this isolated, you know, uh, I don't know her very well personally, but she seems, seems to be this kind of journalist just in her little corner, doing her investigation all on her own. Nobody knew whether it would bring a result. 
and suddenly, you know, one year or so later, she breaks this incredible scoop which exposes how um, a company, Cambridge Analytica, was uh, using millions and millions of uh, personal data and, and for, for political manipulation and targeting of voters. This, uh, this investigation ultimately led to Mark Zuckerberg having to face uh, a committee in Congress, right? A, a hearing in, in the US Congress. This, it took some time, but, and this is, so of course this is really, um, you know, powerful, persistent, patient investigation. But the important thing is that that kind of work uh, leads to establishing facts that are hard to ignore, uh, and that have and and those those facts have uh, consequences, political consequences, and allow very very powerful entities. In this case, you know some po political networks and uh, Facebook and uh, the Brexit crowd and the lobbyists and all that uh, allow to hold some of these actors to account. So yes, we all have our smartphone in our pockets, we can all communicate and send things, but I guess the, the as, uh, as, uh, as was said earlier, I think Eric Taberi said it, that you know, the journalism, the technology changes, but the fundamentals of journalism stay the same, which is you, you, you work hard, hard, hard to try to establish facts, and I would add, you work hard, hard, hard to listen to people really, because on a smartphone, there's only so much listening that you're really doing, so you really have to go and talk to people where they are, you know, and uh, one of the beautiful things of journalism, investigative journalism is extremely important, but the beautiful, also, the beautiful side of journalism is just spending time with people, you know, just going into families, spending time with people, and that is something that, you know, uh, not all the journalists can do because many journalists are stuck behind screens or watching a screen. So I think the beauty of journalism and that should be uh, cherished now and uh, and uh, widened is the effort of you know spending time with people and going into communities and doing that local listening. Yeah. This role of um, uh, media or journalist uh, sort of um, uh, going through different social bubbles and trying to reach out for people um, is obviously clear, but one might ask, um, is there a community, somebody we should not talk to as a journalist? Or I, could, I can rephrase it and say, who would you not sit in a panel with. Okay, so the, sitting on a panel with somebody is different from reporting and going to see places and people and listening to them. So on the second category, you know, uh, uh, going to places, seeing people, listening to them, asking questions, you do that, you do that everywhere you can. And you do it especially, you try to do it especially where you're not allowed to go. You know, I was, uh, I was a correspondent in Moscow during some of the worst wars of the uh, worst years of the war in Chechnya. And for me, it was impossible. I wasn't the only one. And it was easier when you were a woman uh, because you were not controlled so much by the mil Russian military at checkpoints. But I, I thought it was impossible not to not to go to Chechnya, to be a correspondent in Moscow, and not to go regularly to Chechnya. So I would go, you know, every two, three months, I would go to Chechnya um, uh, alone, you know, with on my own, independently, not with the Russian military. Um, and on the on the panel thing, you know, I'm in favor of dialogue with uh, with just about everybody, as long as you can really ask the questions and as long as you can contradict somebody freely and as long as you can have the time and the space to do that. I'm, I, I, I'm worried about all these debates where it's, it ends up being a, just a punching game and no, and a shouting game and there's no attempt to really go deep into a particular question. And that kind of television we know as you know is, is very uh, common now. So I'm worried about that the polarizing effect of those types of debates. 
outside those crazy historical debates, I think it's possible to sit down with just about anybody. And as long as you can really, you know, have the time to uh, contradict somebody, to push back, to uh, that's how that's how you can, you know, not hope to convince perhaps, but at least expose the holes in their thinking, you know, if you're talking about really like extreme, you know, far right, horrible far right people, at least you can try to by patiently um, arguing and presenting and asking questions, you can try to expose the fact that these people have no solutions for us. They have no solutions. They only have a capacity to his make a hysterical debate, you know. We will expand the answer, ask a uh, question to other panelists. Would you like to react to that? Because I would like to ask other panelists, is there someone you wouldn't sit in a panel with? Um, so, um, I think the answer is yes, um, but I can't think immediately of who it is who I wouldn't sit in the panel with. Maybe but a type of person? A Holocaust denier, probably. So, there's a great poem by Zbigniew Herbert, the Polish poet, which is called Potenga Smaku, the power of taste. And there are some people who I would find it so distasteful to sit on a panel with that I would want a BBC journalist or a Guardian journalist to go and interview them, but personally, I would rather go and have a drink. Um, I wanted to say two things, because I, I've spent the last 40 years working both as an academic and as a journalist, as, as someone else who did this, Conor Cruz O'Brien said, you have one foot in each grave. Um, and this book, which I, I just want to mention has just been republished with a new chapter, was based on working as a reporter here in Prague, uh, in Budapest, in Warsaw, in Berlin in 1989. And it was a huge privilege of my life to be able to be there with a notebook, writing things down as it was happening. And I think you've got to distinguish between, as Natalie said, what's happened to the business of journalism and what's happened to being a good journalist. The business of journalism has changed out of all recognition in the 40 years I've been working as a journalist, so that now we have the problem that we don't have established wealthy, respected media which have a business model which enables you to do difficult investigative reporting, which is very expensive, right, which takes a lot of investment. Instead, we have platforms like Facebook and Google, which are near monopolies, and monopoly is always a problem for the business of journalism. So if you think about the problem in communist Czechoslovakia, one way of thinking about the party state is simply as an absolute monopoly of all sources of information. And we're getting close to that in the case of Facebook and Google. So there are big structural problems that we have to go after, these private superpowers like Facebook and Google. But the qualities of being a good journalist haven't changed at all. And the essential quality of being a good journalist is not being objective. Nobody is objective. It's being honest. Honesty is the key quality of a good journalist. There are other ones like persistence, ingenuity, accuracy, uh, writing well, vivid imagination, all of the above. But the one essential quality for a good journalist is honesty, which is why the model for us all is George Orwell, homage to Catalonia. After writing one of the greatest books ever written of political writing, he says on the last page, by the way, you've always got to watch out for my personal bias, my personal subjectivity, well, for what I saw, I didn't saw. So in effect, Orwell says, don't believe me, and therefore he is the one person we really do believe, right? So that's the essential quality, the, the, the commitment to the ethos of the reporter as someone who is trying to the best of our ability, as honestly as possible, to tell it what it is. So as if there are some young people in the audience today I mean, I think my message would be, we need better journalists and better politicians. So maybe one or two of you would like to do one or other of those. <laughs> Timothy. 
Well, since I'm the since I'm the only one here who's not a reporter, I just wanted to say that I think our remarks thus far have understated just how important reporting is. Um, in our internet world, plagiarism is free. Inventing things is all is almost free, but reporting a fact has a cost, and not just a financial cost but also a human cost. It takes time to get into that family's house as well as money to support the investigative journalism. And that means in, in our world, we're surrounded by imitations and copies. We're surrounded by fictions, but the facts are scarce. We spend all of our time talking about the news, but there really isn't very much news in fact. When I think back to 1989, one of the great contrasts was I could sit in the United States of America and read in American English every day half a dozen reports from half a dozen different American reporters who were actually in the place they were writing about. That is no longer true. In the meantime, first in Russia, then in America, and now it's starting in Europe, the local news is, is, is disappearing as well. The local news is one of the most important preconditions to everything we're talking about. Because without local facts, people don't trust journalists. Without local facts, people don't have a basis for a conversation about civil society or policy or, or law. So everything that we think is good about the West, everything depends upon facts. And our, the assumption, one of the big assumptions I think that we made wrongly in and around 1989 was that the facts were just around us. They were just there. It turns out that that's not true. It turns out that you have to produce the facts conscientiously, which is why the investigative reporters are the most important people we have. Without them, we lose literally everything. And so if we think about how we're gonna have a better Europe or a better West, we have to make sure that we're building bulwarks around the investigative reporters that we have, and we're thinking about how we can produce more, 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 more facts. Because not only do you need facts to defend yourselves against your own politicians, against your own businesses, you need facts to know what the big problems are. Is there global warming or not? Yes. Is there tremendous oligarchy? Yes. But without reporters, you don't know anything. But even more than that, there's only one unpredictable thing in the world, I think. What you like is predictable. Facebook predicts it. What you want to hear is predictable. Facebook predicts it. The only unpredictable thing in the world are the facts. And free people are unpredictable people. So if you want to be unpredictable and you want to be free, you need the people who produce the facts. Thank you. So the, the time is almost up. We have a, one short question, however, or request. We are tonight celebrating 30 years of existence of a, one, may I say, remarkable magazine. I'm very proud to be part of that team. We would like to ask you, is there something you would like to wish to respect and to its team? Milan Šimečka can start. Um. Uh, yes, uh, uh, and I, I, I just wanted to add what, what, I, what, what was said here. You know, I, I had spent 10 years of my life with respect, and, uh, and, I, and, I'm, and I, for, for me, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy in a sense that I know that many people think that respect is some mystery. I mean, many people don't believe why can be this journalists so successful. I mean, it's just, it's something behind that shortage of whatever. Uh, and these people, mostly those who doesn't understand, do, don't understand journalism, they just don't understand that it means, as, as Timothy said, it means just honesty. It means only that doing a journalism is be, to being honest to s yourself and to the facts and to everything and to your reader. And, and I know it's just, uh, now, when, I, when we talk about heroes, I, I, I do believe that 
journalists whose Tim was talking about, investigative journalists, but not only those, are the heroes of, of, uh, of this era. And I never thought that uh, as a former dissident, I never thought about myself as a hero, but I can, I can compare. And I can tell you, I mean, the journalists, good journalists today are uh, sometimes braver than the dissidents in the past were. And I can tell you because I know what it means. I mean, I can compare with myself. I'm not that journalist as you are. I mean, I'm in just a kind of salon journalism. Uh, I write mostly say so. But I, I can say it. I know it. And I never thought about democracy that would need heroes. But it does. I mean, Bertolt, Bertolt Brecht had his, in his place saying, unhappy the country which needs uh, heroes. It's not true. We need heroes all the time. Democracy needs heroes. So I just wish you, in respect from the next half century, uh, be heroes like you are, um, because we need you. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else wants to wish something to us, Timothy Gardnash? I wish you another 30 years. At be least. Because I think we're, and, and since this has emerged from this whole panel, I think we're heading towards very dark and difficult times, not just for this country, but for Europe and for the world. I think there are really huge challenges facing us, and we may look back nostalgically and say what an amazingly good time that was, as people did after 1918. And so, if respect is still going strong in 30 years' time, that means not only that you've been doing a great job, but the, the world is still in some reasonably decent shape where a great magazine like this can survive. Thank you. Yeah, and I, 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 would, uh, I would just wish, um, wish you, of course, to continue with the great work that the whole team is doing, but also with this spirit of this team spirit that I, you know, I feel that I, and I, I feel that there's a team spirit in, in respect. Of course, in any newsroom, there are always disputes and, uh, you know, competition and all, all these things are, are realities. But what I, per, what perhaps explains why respect keeps, you know, keeps going and, and, and is that success is, is that there's a capacity to create a team spirit in sometimes difficult circumstances, you know, fighting for something together and that's really important and I think it's it's uh, not by chance that there's going to be a rock concert or you know concert after this because I just think that you know it means that you're having fun you know as you're as you're um, waging all those battles for good information good comment you're you're also having a party and that's it's great <laughs> yes, tonight know, we are having a party yes <laughs> Timothy Snyder Ja bi pšal, a bi vsi češi rozumjeli, co vi doležite, a ja, vam, ja, ja bi vam pšal moc, moc, moc faktov. <laughs> So this is it, our time is up. Um, this is the end of our debate. So I would like to thank you, the audience, uh, for being with us, for listening, and I wish you enjoy the rest of the evening. And above all, I would like to thank our panelists, obviously, Timothy Snyder, Natalie Nugaret, Milan Chemechka, Timothy garden -Esch. Good evening. Thank you, enjoy the party.
Já děkuji Silvi, Kateřině a všem hostům, kteří si svůj vzácný čas rezervovali pro dnešní večer s respektem. A dámy a pánové, ještě vás poprosím o chviličku strpení, než se s vámi přijde rozloučit čev redaktor Erik Tabery a než se večer přehoupne do druhé hudební části večera. Mám pro vás už jen pár praktických a důležitých informací. Nejprve se našla peněženka pana Roberta Dohnala, tak doufám, že jsme vám udělali radost, pane Dohnale, teďka bude vaše peněženka bude vzadu u stolečku, kde se odevzdávají tlumočnická zařízení. Tím pádem bych vás taky chtěla poprosit, abyste ve víru oslav nezapomněli tlumočnická zařízení vrátit. Děkujeme. Hudební část večera začne kolem 22. hodiny a já připomínám přestavbu sálu, takže vás poprosím, abyste během pauzy uvolnili celý tady ten spodní prostor, protože se židle budou dávat pryč. Lucerna bude dnes večer otevřena do druhé hodiny raní. Další zpráva je, že pan Eš s námi ještě chvíli zůstane a vlevo vzadu bude mít svůj stůl, kde si můžete nechat podepsat jeho novou knihu Rok zázraků. Samozřejmě platí, že redaktorky a redaktoři Respektu tady po celý zbytek večera budou také. Můžete si zakoupit jejich publikace a pozdravit je, nechat si knihy podepsat. Tak... Já bych teď také za sebe, už jen krátce, protože vím, že večer byl dlouhý, ale chtěla bych také respektu popřát k narozeninám. Pro nás čtenáře je respekt cenný svou profesionalitou, objektivností, důvěryhodností a také tím, že se věnuje tématům, která nejsou populární, ale která je potřeba vytáhnout na světlo. A já vám chci za to vyjádřit opravdu velké poděkování, protože je to v dnešní době vzácné. A k těm třicátinám vám všem z respektu redaktorkám a redaktorům chci popřát to základní, pevné zdraví a hodně síly, abyste mohli svou důležitou a velmi náročnou profesi vykonávat dlouho, protože vás potřebujeme. Dámy a pánové, já se s vámi loučím, děkuji za vaši pozornost a závěr večera bude patřit Eriku Taberimu, šéf redaktorovi respektu. Eriku, prosím. Je to vaše. Děkuji moc, já si na to zvyknu, <laughs> pozor. Já jsem chtěl vlastně jenom poděkovat strašně moc nejenom panelistům, kteří byli úplně úžasní, ale i vám, protože jste byli skvělé publikum, o čem jsem přesvědčen, že vědí i oni. A chtěl jsem zároveň zdůraznit, byť to tady padlo, my tady zůstáváme jako redakce, jsme vám k dispozici, vůbec se nestýte nás zastavit, zeptat se, jsme tady vlastně skoro komplet. A jestli dovolíte, na tomhle tom večeru se podělá spousta lidí. A já bych chtěl cíleně ještě poděkovat našim skvělým moderátorkám, které dnešním večerem tady vlastně vás provázely. Takže já prosím Silvii Lodr, Kateřinu Šafeříkou a Andreu Procházkou, aby ještě přišli ke mně. Bude to krátký. Protože vy jste na konci vlastně děkovali těm panelistům, tak já chci poděkovat vám, protože jste to zvládli skvěle. Byla to radost, výborně jste tím provázeli, už jsem si to velice dozvěděl, jsme se spoustu z věcí a myslím si, že do velké míry díky vám. Tak se vám chtěl dát na ten prostor, aby jsme vám mohli i všichni zatleskat. Užijte si večer, koncert, my tady s vámi zůstáváme, moc děkujeme.